All right, if you would please be seated and get out your Bibles and open up first to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. It's good to be here with all of you today. It is going to be a, a very sort of interesting week weather-wise uh, around here. I, was, I wasn't kidding. I don't think I'm going to have school, but probably four days this week. At least that's my prediction um, with the way things are setting themselves up. How many of you guys remember the polar vortex winter in 2014? You don't remember that? Polar Void. You remember that, don't you, Will? You were walking around reading meters, weren't you? <laughs> you would remember that. That that winter, we had a whole week of uh, below minus 25 wind chills for an entire week. I didn't have school that entire week. It was like virtually the week right after Christmas break. We had 18 snow days, and I didn't get out till almost July 4th. It was ridiculous. I hope that doesn't happen this time, okay? But anyway, 1 Timothy chapter 4. I want to continue our series of studies on bodybuilding. And we took a break from this last week because we had our um, annual meeting. But if you look out you know, onto the calendar, onto the horizon of 2019, we don't really have another interruption, at least until Easter, which is sometime toward the end of April. I'm not planning to be gone. We don't have any special uh, Sundays necessarily, per se, except maybe something I might do at the end of March uh, on the Lord's Supper. But other than that, we have a good chunk of time here to really just get into this study again without being interrupted by other things. And that's really what I'm looking to do here this morning is to start that. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. This is the very first uh, verse that we read in this series. Verse 8, Paul says, Refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. And as we've been talking about the issue of bodybuilding, that's what we've been talking about, building up the body of Christ, exercising ourselves unto godliness. You know, it is still the first month of the year, one of the biggest resolutions that people have is to be, get healthier, right? To exercise more, to eat better, to lose weight, those kinds of things. And what Paul's talking about here is not that stuff in a physical sense. He's talking about that stuff in a spiritual sense, exercising yourself unto godliness, verse 8, for bodily exercise profiteth little. Now that's not your text verse to prove that you shouldn't physically exercise. That verse is talking about law keeping. That verse is talking about uh, keeping the law and keeping you know religious performance type of expectations. Those are the things that profiteth little. But godliness, he says, is profitable unto all things, having promise of life that now is and that which is to come. So what we've been talking about is the idea of bodybuilding, the idea of exercising ourselves unto godliness, about building up the spiritual body of Christ. And don't turn there, but in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul talks about again, working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so just like in a physical sense, you, you work out, you exercise your muscles, your cardiovascular capacity, and these sorts of things, in the spiritual reality, in your, in your life as a believer... There's some working out. There's some exercising unto godliness that Paul is talking about. Come with me to Philippians, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 4. Another verse that we've read a lot is verse 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, where he says, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, I haven't pointed it out, but it just strikes, it struck me this week as I was studying that when that verse says, at the end of verse 16 there, it says, maketh increase of the body. When people work out physically, that's usually what they're trying to accomplish. They may be trying to increase their physical cardiovascular capacity, for example their ability to, um, to do things over a long period of time. They may be trying to increase their muscular strength. They're trying to make some sort of an increase in the realm of their physical self, in the realm of their physical body. But that's not what he's talking about in that verse. He's talking about the increase of the body of Christ. He's talking about the edification of the body in love. And Paul's talking about something spiritual in verse 16 there, not something physical. But the parallels are there. Come over to Romans 12. This is another important text verse that I've been using as the basis of what we've been doing in this study, in this series of studies. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 4, Romans 12, 4, For as we have many members in one body, all the members have not the same office. Verse 5, So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. So as we've been thinking about bodybuilding and talking about building up the body of Christ, we've been spending a lot of time on this one anothering principle. Okay, this this these mutually reciprocating relationships that members of this body have one of another or one for another there. And so we've been looking at that. I'm not going to go through the list right now of all the things we've looked at. I would just direct your attention, if you would, to the last one that we've been considering, and go to Galatians 6. The last one that we've been considering is the issue of bearing one another's burdens. Now, we spent two weeks on this, and I just want to say a few things about it this morning to set up what I want to talk about out of Ephesians 4. As we think about bearing one another's burdens, we get that out of Ephesians chapter 6. I'm messing things up. I'm sorry. Galatians 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Paul says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The verb bear is the idea to lift, literally or figuratively, to endure, to sustain, to receive, to carry, to take up, right? And so we've talked about the issue of, of taking up and coming alongside somebody and helping them bear a burden. We've talked about how that's an imperative statement, how Paul is commanding believers to do these sorts of things. And if you recall to two weeks ago, uh, I'm sorry, three weeks ago, we saw that in doing that, when believers bear each other's burdens, they fulfill the law of Christ in verse 2. And we talked about what that meant, about how when believers come alongside each other and they, they, they have the same care one for another that Christ had, they actually fulfill the righteous requirement of the law to love your neighbor as yourself. And so we went through all those things. I'm just reminding you of them here. And then two weeks ago, I addressed some questions that came up as a result of my first teaching on Galatians 6.2. The first question that I touched on was, should we bear the burdens of non-believers in the same way or with the same regularity that we do, that we do for those who are not saints? And again, I don't want to, I'm not going to rehash all of that because I want to make progress. But essentially, I said, no, believers do not have the same obligation to non-believers that they have to believers. And I went through some reasons why, just briefly, okay? I said they don't have the same obligation toward non-believers in terms of bearing their burdens. Reason number one is because all of Paul's one and othering statements are made to believers and presuppose that the people he is addressing are already members of the body of Christ or members one of another in Christ's body. The second, those who are outside of Christ are coming at things in their lives from an entirely different system of values. They don't value and esteem the same things believers are instructed to value and esteem. They have a completely different mindset and frame of reference that they're coming from, and they are, they're frankly following the course of this world charted by the adversary in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. But I also said that while believers do not have the same obligation toward non-believers in terms of bearing their burdens, I do, however, believe that saints have an obligation before God to do good and to exhibit the love of Christ to those who are not saved. Look at Galatians 6, verse 10. Look at Galatians 6, verse 10. Right here in this context, he says, And as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto who? All men. That would include believers and who? Non-believers, non -believers, unbelievers, right? But then notice the qualification. Especially unto them who are of the household of what? Of faith, right? So as a saint, do you have an obligation to do good unto all men? That's what the verse says, right? But especially to those who are of the household of faith. So the obligation level to me is clearly not the same, okay? Believers have an obligation to other saints in a way that is in terms of helping them bear their burdens that we don't necessarily have to those who are not saved. Now, I've thought about that some since two weeks ago. 
And I think that I should have been more clear about that just a little bit. And what I want to give you or offer to you for your consideration is sort of a priority list. So if you're thinking about your life and the issue of bearing one another's burdens, and if we're thinking and understanding that the direct instruction of Galatians 6 verse 2 is given to believers for other believers, one of another, for each other, as members of the body of Christ, but we're also keeping in mind that we have an obligation to do good unto all men, especially to them that are of the household of faith, as we think about that all men category, or those in your life that are not saved, those who are not directly coming under the instruction of Galatians 6 2, it seems to me that there's some additional considerations that I've thought about, okay? And that were pointed out to me for consideration that I've processed a little bit and want to, I want to just touch on briefly. I would offer the following priority list in terms of assisting the lost, okay? Number one, absolutely would be your family, your unsafe family members, okay? You've no doubt been in situations, see, you grow up with these people. They know you, Larry, though nobody else knows you, right? And for you to be all, oh, Jesus, 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 and in the meantime, they've got a problem and you're unwilling to help them because they're lost, that's probably not going to look good or reflect good upon you as a testimony for Christ, right? So as you prioritize your scarce time and resources, the things that you have in your life available to people to help them with things, as far as assisting the lost, I think top priority needs to be given to your family members. This is my opinion. You could take issue with it, I'm sure. Second, I didn't know where to put two or three you can make an argument that the way, where I have two, maybe should go for three, and where I have three, maybe can go for two. They could be interchangeable, so I'll give them both to you. Two and three I have on my list would be friends and coworkers, people that you work with, people that you interact with regularly, that um, you have mutual relationship with, even though they're not necessarily saints and so forth, right? So I have on my list, I have family members, I have friends, I have co-workers, four I have as acquaintances. People that you kind of know through a guy who you knew, and you might be able to help them with the one thing that they've got going on over there, okay? And if you can, maybe maybe it's appropriate to help out or what have you, okay? But to me, the, that that's a lower priority. And then number five, I just simply have as everyone else. Now, I'm not presenting to you, that list to you as some sort of infallible, inspired list of priorities. I'm just saying, as you think through that issue of understanding that Galatians 6 2, bear you one another burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, is written to saints, and that a, a member of the body of Christ does have an obligation to another believer in terms of helping them with their burden, but that that same obligation does not extend to the lost or to those who are unsaved but that we still have the instruction to do good unto all men. In the doing of good unto all men, okay, I'm saying that there should be a priority attached to that, to family, friends, co-workers, acquaintances, and then anybody else you might come into contact with. You might include neighbors as acquaintances. You might organize that any other way. I just present that to you for your consideration. The second question that I tried to address two weeks ago and I've abbreviated it down, is at what point does bearing the burden of another saint become an enabling of that saint's bad behavior? So remember we talked about that last two weeks ago, okay? And we went through some verses. We went to some verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 where Paul is dealing with the... With the um, now understand, if you're dealing now with a believer... You should be theoretically dealing with a person who does have the same set of values, the, and es, values and esteems the same things that you do as a member of the body of Christ. And they should be getting them from the same source, and that's the Word of God, right? And so as we think about the, the, how this would relate to a saint, it's gonna, the dynamic of it is going to be different than if we're dealing with an unbeliever. And we looked at 1 Corinthians 5 where Paul tells the Corinthians to take that guy who was involved in that gross fornication there and literally tells him to put away from themselves that wicked person. 
And I use that as an illustration to say that even in the Scripture, are believers supposed to indefinitely tolerate the bad behavior of other believers? The answer to that is what? No, okay? I also went to Titus chapter 3 and looked at Paul's statement about heresy and how he that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, and I said that verse is talking about error in doctrine. That verse is not talking about poor conduct. So if I go to somebody two or three times over an error in doctrine and an error in belief, and they refuse to change their mind or they want to persist in whatever that thing is, after the third admonition, do I have any further obligation to that situation? No, but that's in a particular instance where you're dealing with wrong belief. Okay, what we're, ta what we're talking about, or what the question that was uh, asked of me is centering around, is not really wrong belief. It's wrong conduct. Okay, it's 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 conduct unbecoming of a saint, and what is the obligation, and at what point does helping that person become enabling them? Come with me to 1 Corinthians 6. I told you that I don't have a hard and fast answer for that. What I provided you with is what I call Paul's decision-making grid. To think through this on your own. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Paul says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Expedient means profitable. Okay? All things are lawful unto me, all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of what? Of any. And then with that, you also want to get chapter 10. Go get chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, very similar verse, but uh, uh, does teach something different nonetheless. Verse 23, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful, but all things what? Edify not. So here's what I said. I said, I believe that, honest, that honestly and prayerfully employing Paul's decision-making grid will help a believer discern how to handle these types of circumstances. Okay, So here are the questions that I think you should be asking yourself based upon these verses. Okay, Number one, is it expedient? Is it profitable? Is the way that I'm handling the situation with this believer profitable? Not only for me, but also for who? For them. Sometimes you get a call of somebody that's in crisis, right? And sometimes it is absolutely the right thing to do to help get them through the night, so to speak. Okay? But if you just get them through the night and don't help them lay out a plan, a long-term plan for how to deal with whatever the problem is, then that's not really very what? Profitable. It's not profitable for you. It's not profitable for them. It's unrealistic for them to expect that you're going to always, every time you, they call you, bail them out. Okay, So my first thing was, is it expedient, is it profitable to myself and other believers? The second thing is, does it edify? Is the way I'm dealing with this person in this situation, trying to help them bear their burden, is it edifying them and is it edifying me? Is it mutually edifying the way I'm choosing to deal with this situation? Third, does it make for peace among the brethren? Does, deal, does the way I'm dealing with it uh, making for peace, or am I causing division the way I'm choosing to handle the situation? And then fourth question is, am I allowing it to have power over me? And I talked briefly about how people, when somebody comes to you for help, there's something about that that excites your flesh a little bit. And get you, woo, hey, they need me, and so I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And I said that if you're doing all that stuff at the expense of your current relationships and your current responsibilities and, the, and, and your own family and your own kids and your own job and your own this and your own that, now you're allowing that situation to have power what? Over you. So I want to leave you with an illustration that I thought of about this since two weeks ago. So to tell my illustration, I need to go back to the last Sunday of 2018. The last Sunday of 2018, it's the evening 
So it's the day before New Year's Eve. Becky and I are sitting in our living room, and I hear this terrible noise. This ter- it sounds like an explosion. And, I'm, and I looked at her, and she looked at me, and we were like, what was that? So we went downstairs and checked on the kids. Were the kids fine? Everything seemed to be in order. The furnace hadn't blown up. The water heater was good. Nothing. Uh, so we, we, we sort of uh, eliminated all what would seem to be the obvious things. Now, some of you have been to our house, some of you haven't, but where we are now, we're kind of in the country a little bit, and there's people around us that like to shoot guns a lot. And so my next thing was, well, somebody must have been shooting their gun. In fact, I think one of my neighbors has like a mini replica of a Civil War cannon that they like to fire from time to time. I'm not even joking, okay? I hear this noise, and it, it, it can't, it's, it's louder than a gun or a rifle. And it's, I think they've got one, but anyway. So my, my next thing was that that's what it was, that somebody had been shooting a gun or something like that, and so we went to bed and thought nothing of it, okay? The next day, it's now New Year's Eve, and we've got to get to the store because we had some company coming over that evening from out of state, and we didn't have any food. Or, well, we had food, but we needed to get stuff for the company, right? And so we go out to the garage now, and... Becky hits the button, and the garage store starts freaking out, going up and going down, and going up and going down, and going up and going down. And I'm like, what in the world is this? And so we hit the button again, and eventually, I'm messing with the garage door, and I don't realize that the noise that I heard the night before was one of the springs had given way on the garage door. Okay? And my garage door, the way it was set up, was that there was not a spring in the middle that pulled it up, but there were springs on both sides, and they were not pulling at the same tension, and so they were kind of fighting with each other to get the door up, right? So we get the door about three-quarters of the way up, and I say, okay, hit it again, let's bring it down and reset it so it'll go up. Well, now what happens is the lifter arm rips open from the door, and at this point, I'm like holding the door like this, And when that lifter arm gives way, all the way to that door came down on my arms, and I was not ready for it, right? It's been almost five weeks, and my elbow still hurts. All the the ligaments and stuff still hurt in, in my elbow, okay? So where am I going with this? We still have animals and stuff that need to be fed. I still have to lift the water jugs to feed the animals. I still have to do all this stuff, right? So now I've got an injury here. So what do I do? I start overcompensating for that injury with my shoulder. So I got an injury in my body here, and I start overcompensating for the injury in my shoulder. Now, I don't have a shoulder injury yet, but I know that if this continues here, eventually will I get one here. So what's my illustration here? In the body of Christ, sometimes you've got an issue with the elbow. And you come along and you try to help. You're the shoulder and you come along and try to help the elbow. And you help the elbow for a while, right? But in the meantime, the, are you putting extra stress and extra strain on that shoulder? And as you put extra stress and extra strain on that shoulder to help the elbow, if this continues long enough, eventually is your shoulder going to go out? And when your shoulder goes out, then your whole arm's not good for what? For anything, right? And so my point is, as we think about this question that was asked of me about the obligate, at what point does a saint's responsibility to bear the burden of, a, of another saint become obligation? I think it clearly can if it starts to negatively impact you as the one who's coming alongside to try to what? Help. And so you have to have boundaries. You have to have framework from which you are going to make those decisions. Okay? Does that make sense? Don't, don't, If you're the shoulder, yes, you have an obligation to help that elbow. But if you you are wearing yourself thin and weakening your own capacity because you're so focused on helping that elbow, you're not doing your entire arm any good. And if you're not doing your entire arm any good, are are you harming the entire body? Does that make sense? Don't tell me if it doesn't because it just hurt my feelings. Come with me. Let's... So all of that was some further information for you for your consideration. Come with me to Ephesians 4. Just by the way, 
I don't think that illustration is, is wholly out of order when you think about what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, shall the eye say, you know, to the ear, because I'm not the ear, I'm therefore not of what? The body, you remember that whole discussion that Paul has in 1 Corinthians 12 about that? That's the way I see those issues. Now we come here, look at verse 1, look at verse 1 Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you, that, I, that means I beg you, I implore you, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called. So Paul wants the believers to have a worthy walk. He wants them to walk in line and in step with who they've been made in the Lord Jesus Christ, their position. Verse 2, how should we do this? With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, notice, forbearing one another, how? In love. The Word of God never ceases to amaze me. I've never, until this particular series, I've never taken the time to take all of these one another statements and just line them up and look at how they occur and what they teach when they occur. It's interesting to me that the last one that we saw was about bearing one another's burdens, and the very next one we see is about forbearing one another. Those are similar, but not what? They're not the same. Bearing one another's burden is coming alongside and helping them carry and shoulder that burden for a time, right? Forbearing one another is different than that. It's similar, but it's not exactly the same. So here in Ephesians 4.2 is where we encounter Paul's next one anothering statement. In this verse, Paul beseeches the Ephesians to be forbearing towards one another. How? In love. Okay? So we need to kind of break this down a little bit like we normally do and talk about it, make sure we understand what's going on here. Okay? So the word there that is translated forbearing means to hold oneself up against. To hold oneself up against. Now think about a construction. You have a you have load bearing what? Walls. Okay? What is a load bearing wall? It's a wall that is helping to bear the weight of the structure, right? It's carrying weight on it, right? That's the idea. He says the, the, the meaning of the word translated forbearing here means to hold oneself up against, figuratively, to put up with, to bear with, to endure, to forbear, to suffer. Now think about your house. If you have, if you have a weight-bearing wall and it all and it and it ceases to forbear the weight, what happens to your house? <laughs> Collapses, right? That's the idea. It's that concept. Let's look at a few other places. Hold your hand there and come with me to Matthew 17. You watch these uh, home improvement shows, and they, they go in there, and they got all these grand plans. Ah, oh, we're going to take that wall out, and we're going to take that wall out over there, and we're going to open this whole thing up, and they, they sell them on this whole thing, and then they get into the project. Ah, oh, wait a minute. That's a weight-bearing wall. We can't do that unless we get this... $5,000 pillar beam to insert up into the ceiling, then we can do what we told you we could do, if you ever watch any of these shows, right? Because they're weight-bearing. If, if, you, if you take that out, the structure will no longer what? Hold itself. It will no longer support itself. It will collapse upon itself. Now look at Matthew 17. Look at the way the Lord Jesus Christ uses this word. <clears throat> Verse 16. So I'm in Matthew 17, Verse 16. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Verse 17. Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? He's referring to himself there. Now watch. How long shall I, what? Suffer you. Uh, let me ask you a question. When he says that, is he like really happy with him? Or is he frustrated? He's frustrated. When he says, how long shall I suffer you? He's saying, how long am I going to have to what? Put up with you guys before you what? Before you get what I'm doing here, right? So how, in other words, how long am I going to have to suffer you or forbear or endure this kind of stuff from you guys? You're not getting it, is what he's saying, 
Okay? Come with me to Colossians chapter 3. So the word translated suffer is the same word translated forbear. Colossians chapter 3, look with me at verse 13. Now here it's very clear. You might want to mark this one because we'll be coming back to this in a few minutes, but he says there in verse 13, forbearing one another. So that's the same statement that we have in Ephesians chapter 4. And, and here's our next one for next week, and forgiving one another. Uh-oh. And forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So there's our next one another, and we're going to look at next week, forgiving one another. But you see forbearing there. Come to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith. Now watch, in all your what? Persecutions. Were the Thessalonians enduring persecution? Then notice what it says. And tribulations which ye what? Endure. The word translated endure is the same word translated suffer is the same word translated forbear. Okay? So if what would you do if you went home and you, you could talk to your walls and the walls said, you know, I just don't want to endure this weight anymore. I think I'm going to quit. The house would what? It would fall, right? So we understand enduring, suffering, forbearing are all talking about the same thing. The, the, the Thessalonians here have persecution. They have tribulation. And they're enduring it with patience, according to what verse 4 is talking about. Notice, what it, notice the connection in verse 4 between patience and endurance. Verse 4 again. So that we ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God, for your what? Patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations, that ye what? If you're going to endure something, are you going to do it with patience? Yeah. If you don't have patience, you're going to have a hard time what? Enduring it. Okay? Come with me to 2 Timothy 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. And I think, oh, I'm in the wrong spot. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. Notice what it says. For the time will come, Paul's talking about the end of the dispensation of grace, for the time will come when they, when they will not do what? Endure sound doctrine. But shall heap unto themselves, <clears throat> but after their own loss shall they heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. Come back to Ephesians 4. So to forbear... To forbear means to suffer, to endure. It, it, it has the idea of to bear with, to put up with, okay? To hold oneself up against. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, with all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another. How? In love. The, the definition of of the English word forbearing means the following according to Noah Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language. Number one, ceasing, pausing, withholding from action, exercising patience and indulgence. That's what you have to do with your kids. There's literally a verse later in Ephesians where Paul talks to people and he says, forbearing, threatening. In other words, what? Why don't you go to chapter, just quick, go to Ephesians 6. The verse I'm looking at is Ephesians 6, verse 9. Ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, what? Threatening, knowing that your master also in heaven, neither is their respective persons with him. 
If, you're, if you are a business person, if you are a master and you have people under you, Paul says that you should forbear what? Threatening. Okay? So to forbear threatening means you're going to withhold it. You're not going to use fear of punishment as the motivation to get people to do what you want. You're going to use a different motivator. You're going to use a love motivator. You're going to use something that is going to really be spurring them on. So the idea of forbearing in English, again, let me read it again, ceasing, pausing, withholding from action, exercising patience. The second meaning is patient or long-suffering. The third meaning is a ceasing or restraining from action, patience, long-suffering. So to forbear with, to look at, go to Ephesians 4 again, verse 2, to be forbearing to one another means what? Let me just be blunt about it. It means there are going to be people in the body of Christ that irritate you. It means there are going to be other saints that you don't necessarily get along with. It means there are going to be members of the body of Christ who you don't, you know, you just don't really what? You don't really fit. You don't really, you, you don't really mesh together. You got differences. You don't really think about things the same way. And they might irritate you and so on and so forth. But how are you supposed, what's your attitude about that supposed to be? To fix them? Ah, I know what's wrong with you, sister, brother. If you would just do this, then we'd be great. Is that what he's saying? It's the opposite of what he's saying. Come with me to Proverbs 25. I say this a lot, and I mean it. Proverbs chapter 25. A lot of times when you sit and listen to preaching, you're like, oh, so-and-so really needs to hear this. If so-and-so would only hear this, that, that would fix what? Everything. But you know what? So-and-so's not here, and you are. And maybe you need to hear it. Maybe I need to hear it. Maybe we need to hear it. And maybe the only thing that we can really address and take care of is us, not so-and-so. So-and-so's going to do what so-and-so's going to do, but who do I have control over? Me. I have control over my response. I have control over my attitude. I have control over how I'm going to respond in a given situation, right? And I have the instruction to forbear one another. So I, when I see that other saint coming who I don't really like or get along with that well, under grace, operating in love, can I forbear with them? Can I, can I greet them still? Can I still practice the other one anotherings that we've looked at with that person, even though maybe they're not my favorite saint to see coming? Now, don't get all high and mighty like you guys don't know what I'm talking about. Okay? Proverbs 25, look at verse 15. Now, watch what it says. By short forbearing. Is that what it says? No. There's no such thing as short forbearing. Forbearing by definition is something that's going to take, that's going to be a long one. A long time. Look what the verse says. But verse 15, by long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. Okay? The reason I went there is to show you that forbearing by nature is what kind of a deal? It's a long deal. It's not a short deal. If it's short, you know that kid that's irritating you in the line at Great America or Meyer, or that person that's irritating you in the restaurant or whatever, you know that you only have to deal with that for a little bit of time, and when it's done, it'll be over, and you're done, and you're on with your life. You're probably never going to see that person again, right? But not so when you come to the assembly. Not so in your family. Not so at work, right? Those people are not going to be probably just short inconveniences, they, there may be some that are going to require some long, patient what? Forbearing. Okay? So I want you to see that the nature of forbearing is a long process. 
You hope that the walls in your house bear the load as long as the house stands. If they ever cease bearing the load, the house will no longer what? Stand. And you hope that it's going to happen over a long period of time, right? You know the parable about the man who built his house on the sand versus the man who built his house on the what? On the rock, right? The problem with the guy who built his house on the sand was that when the, when the storm came, it did what? It washed it away. It could no longer stand. It could no longer bear the load. It could no longer shoulder the thing. You know the three little pigs, don't you? Right? The first one builds his house out of, I forget, straw, right? The second one builds his house out of sticks. And the third one builds his house out of what? Brick, right? And along comes the big bad wolf, and he blows against the two first two houses, and they what? They fall over. But not the third one. Why? Because they have the capacity for some long forbearing. Because it was built properly. Okay? That's what he's talking about here. Come back to Ephesians 2. Are there, now, now, let me just say, before we get too much into this further, let me just say, I know that... Well, how do I want to put it? If you're a parent, you know that your kids, they just do stuff. And it's not like what they're doing is bad, but it is stinking irritating. Right? It just drives you crazy. Or maybe if you're married, you know this because your spouse does something like this. Okay? And they just, oh, it's like sandpaper. It's like nails on the chalkboard. It's like whatever. And you're just like, just be quiet. Just stop. Right? Verse 2, with all loneliness and meanness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Don't say any names out loud. Don't tell me who it is. But there's probably a believer, a fellow believer, a member of the body of Christ, that for you is like nails on the chalkboard. You would do anything in your life, in your capacity, to avoid dealing with that person, whoever that person is, right? And so what are you instructed to do? You're, you're instructed to still love that person and forbear with that one. I told my wife just the other day, I said, boy, I could be, I could be on my, if I were on my sons every day about everything they did that annoyed me, I'd have a full-time job just correcting them. And then I sit back and I think, well, do I do anything that annoys my Heavenly Father? Ooh. And I know the answer to that is Yes. And when I annoy my Heavenly Father, does He bring out the big rod and start whacking me around? Or does He say, my grace is what? Sufficient. So one of, I'm convinced that one of the big tricks and one of the big skills in parenting is learning what is the difference between what my kids are doing that really matters and is really significant and is really important for who they are and for their character and what they're doing that doesn't really matter where the hill of beans, but I'm just irritated. You're better off as a parent directing your time, energy, and effort into the stuff that is really reflective of, of their character and who they are and, 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 and how they're being raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord than worrying about every dumb noise they make or whether or not they put every dish in the sink or, and, and all that sort of thing. Now, that irritates me. But do I really want to get after that? What stuff do I really want to get after them for and what stuff can I let go? And I'm saying all that as an illustration of this. Does, does God Almighty forbear with me, Brian Ross, every day? Oh, yeah. He does. But see, did He save me? Did He save me by His grace? Did He make me a member of the body of Christ? Did He, did he put me in there even though He knew that I would do stuff that irritated Him? And He still accepts me for who I am, even though, I, look, I'm like a stone in his shoe. Same as you are. Okay? Now, notice what Paul says here. He says, we see again the connection between long-suffering and forbearing. Look at verse 2. With all loneliness and meekness, with long-suffering, what's the next word? Forbearing. 
So right there, that's the same thing that we saw when we went to Proverbs 25, verse 15. That connection, right? Paul is saying that believers are going to need to be patient and long-suffering with one another. And as I just said, notice the connection between long-suffering and forbearing. Now I want to even go further than that. Look at verse 2 again. So that you're, at the end of verse 1, you're to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Now look at verse 2. What's the first word of verse 2? With. So this worthy walk of the vocation is going to be, there's going to be things that are characteristic of it. The first one, he says, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering. Lowliness, meekness, long suffering. Okay? Those three things are the mindset that make the activity of forbearing one another in love possible. Because what is the opposite of lowliness? Pride and haughtiness. What is the opposite of meekness? I'm, the word is escaping me at the moment, but it's similar. It's pride and haughtiness, right? What is the opposite of long-suffering? The short fuse. So if, if, you, if, you have, if you have pride and haughtiness and a short fuse, you have no way to forbear one another in love. So the first part of that verse is the mindset. It's a lowliness and meekness with long suffering. Those three things that allow the believer to forbear one another in what? In love. And all of that, as we're going to see in a minute, all comes back to the other one anotherings and for you and for me not to think of each other as more highly than we want. Ah, and so here we see it in practical terms once again. Go to, go to, um, uh, where am I here? Go to, go to Philippians chapter 2, quickly. Go to Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> Look at verse, <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. <clears throat> There's the word I want, vain glory. Let nothing be done through strife, or what? Vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than who? You're saying, it, it, you have no way to forbear one another in love if you're walking according to or having your mind set strife, vainglory, pride, haughtiness, and a short fuse. There's no way to do it. Okay? So the mindset of worldliness and what we really know, come with me to Galatians 5, what we really need to wrap our mind around of the, is that this mindset of lowliness, meekness, and long-suffering, what Paul's getting at there is that that is really the mindset of the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Huh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, interesting, what's the next one? Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, what's the next one? Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. The mindset of lowliness, meekness, and long-suffering is the mindset of God the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, in your flesh, you are not going to forbear with these other saints. Because your flesh is just going to be focusing on what a miserable, failing irritant they are. Right? And, uh, and when you focus on what a miserable, failing irritant they are, you're not going to be able to forbear them in love. You're going to be in the mindset of Galatians. Go, you're in Galatians 5. Go up to verse 14. No, verse 15. You're going to be in the mindset of bite and devour one another. Because all you're going to be focusing on is them and their problems and their irritations and the things they don't have right and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, you're not paying attention to who? Yourself. And you're also going to be focusing on verse 26. Let us not be desirous of what? Vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. So when Paul's talking there in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 
4, verse 2, about in loneliness, meekness, and long-suffering, forbearing one another. Loneliness, meekness, and long-suffering, that's the mindset, that's the heart attitude of God the Holy Spirit. And when the fruit of the Spirit are being manifest in your life and in your walk, you know what they're going to allow you to do? They're going to allow you to have the activity and the action of being able to forbear one another. But if you're functioning out of the fleshly mindset, out of the old flesh programming, out of the programming that's, that, that's rooted in the course of this world, you're just going to be a miserable, grumpy, unhappy person who can't forbear with anybody. Put another way, our ability to be forbearing is going to come from the Spirit of God working in us to produce his own mindset and his own thinking within us. Our flesh programming is expressed right there in verse 19. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, what's the fundamental problem with adultery? The fundamental problem with adultery is you're being selfish. Right? You want what you want, you don't care what you told your spouse. That, is that haughtiness of mind? Is that is that being is that seeking vain glory? Is that 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 that's giving in to the appetites of the flesh, as it were, verse nineteen. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresy, all these things. If you're gonna be you know what you're gonna do? You know what we're going to do if we forbear? If we're going to forbear one another in love, there's going to be a minimization of strife. Because as strife is minimized, forbearance is what? Maximized. So how do I minimize strife and maximize forbearance? The way I minimize strife and maximize forbearance is not to put myself under the law to control this dirty, nasty flesh. The way I do that is to allow God's Word and His Spirit to put into me the same thought process, the same mindset that God the Holy Spirit has. And when I don't think of myself more highly than I ought, and I think of myself in accordance with meekness and gentleness and long-suffering, you know what I'm able to all of a sudden do? All of a sudden do? I'm able to forbear somebody. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. Our natural flesh programming is in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. And they're all based out of speaking and acting out of self. What can I get? What's in it for me? I'm irritated. I'm mad. I this. I deserve this. I should have this. I should that, 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 that. Who are you to tell me I can't? Amen. All that sort of whining sort of thing. Go back to Colossians chapter 3. I want you to see one more thing about this. I have to be honest with you that one understanding right division and understanding dispensational Bible study is an awesome thing. But I think the things that I'm getting out of this are just as awesome because what I'm getting out of this is that what I do in my life matters. Now, what we're, what we're doing here is rooted and built out of that, an understanding of that, but this is really impacting how I think about what I do with my own family, what I do with my own kids, what I do with my own students, what I do with my own friends and other family members, and so on. Look at Colossians chapter 3, look at verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Okay, okay, put on what? Holiness. Sorry, I messed it up. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Galatians, or sorry, Ephesians 4.2 said, lowliness, meekness, long-suffering. Here in Colossians, Paul's telling them to put on as the elect of God. You see, the put on. You have a choice now as a saint. Before you were saved, you had no other way of functioning than out of this flesh. 
Now that you are a saint, you are a new creature in Christ. Your old man is dead. You have a new man, and God the Holy Spirit is living inside of you, and you and I have a choice about whether or not we're going to put him on. And when we put him on, what does it look like? Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, what? Long-suffering. And again, then look at what's the first part of verse 13? Forbearing one another and forgiving one, one another. Putting on the mindset of God the Holy Spirit in verse 12 enables believers to act like God the Holy Spirit in verse 13. Let me say that again. Putting on the mindset of God the Holy Spirit in verse 12 enables believers to act like God the Holy Spirit in verse 13. Oh. When you mess up, does God the Holy Spirit leave you? Does God the Holy Spirit, ah, oh, it's too dirty in here. See ya. You better confess that before I come back in. Is that the way God the Holy Spirit behaves toward you as a saint? No. Did the Godhead know every single thing that was wrong with you and I when they died in our place, when the Lord Jesus Christ died in our place? Did he pay for everything? Even that dumb thing you're going to do two weeks from now. He did. Right? But when we, by faith, put on the mind, the, literally the mindset, the way of thinking of God the Holy Spirit, and we function out of bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, long-suffering. It allows us to function in the activity of God the Holy Spirit and be forbearing with one another and forgiving with one another. When I mess up, God the Holy Spirit doesn't hold it against my charge. What he says is, oh yeah, we knew you would do that dumb thing. And we what? We took care of it. We've, we've already what? We've already forgiven it. Now, that's not justification for me. If, if you're getting out of this, if that's justification for me to just do dumb stuff, then you're not listening to what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying at all. right? I'm saying the opposite of that. I'm saying put on the thinking of God the Holy Spirit in your life so that we can avoid doing dumb stuff. And when we put on His thinking and make His thoughts our thoughts and His, word, and His thought process our thought process, then the behavior is going to follow from that. Okay, note the connection again between putting on the mindset of long suffering in verse 12 of Colossians with the believer's ability to be forbearing in verse 13. Only the Spirit of God working in the believer is, is capable of accomplishing this. Come with me, I got one more point. It's going to take two verses. Two paths. Go back to Ephesians 2, or Ephesians 4 in one hand, and get 1 Corinthians 13 in the other. <coughs> Look at verse 2, of, uh, I mean Ephesians 4, verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another, how? In love. Okay? I want you to, first, I want you to notice that this is not the first time that love is tied to a one anothering statement. You remember from Galatians chapter 15, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, that we are to by love do what? Serve one another, right? Here the instruction is that we're to be forbearing with one another. How? In love. Okay? So it's not the first time that we've observed the idea of love tied to one of the one anothering statements that Paul's making here. So in this case, he's saying forbearing one another in love. Now I want you to think about that. Come back with me to 1 Corinthians 13. In 1 Corinthians 13, we have the way of charity explained, the way of love explained as being the more excellent way. I'm almost done. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. What's the first thing in verse 
for that charity does? It what? It suffereth long. What have we been talking about when we've been discussing forbearing one another? We've been discussing long forbearing. Forbearing, enduring, put it up with something, pushing against something for how long? A short period of time or a long period of time? A long period of time. And what's the first thing charity does? Suffers long. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. You know that charity functions in lowliness of what? Mind. It vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no what? No evil, right? So is charity going to be functioning out of lowliness, meekness, and long-suffering? Is charity going to be functioning with the mindset of God the Holy Spirit? Okay. Now the opposite of that is pride and haughtiness and self-servingness and all those things that we've talked about in contrast, right? Verse 6, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Now look at verse 7. What does it do? It beareth what? It beareth that annoying saint that you don't like. It beareth the annoyances of your spouse and children. Just being real about it, right? Verse 7. Beareth all things. So does it forbear. Does charity forbear one another in love? Would that be all things? Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. What's the last one there? Endureth what? So, one reason that charity is the more excellent way, now think about this, one reason why charity is the more excellent way is because it actually produces and manifests the life of Christ now in our mortal flesh. When we think about our life and function out of the mindset of God the Holy Spirit in conjunction with the principles of charity here, it actually produces in our mortal flesh now the life of Christ. It manifests the mindset of the Holy Spirit in our mortal flesh. Charity allows us to suffer long. Charity enables us to bear and endure all things. Charity is what allows us to be forbearing toward one another. So I'll come back to Ephesians in conclusion. Don't look at that expression in love as a throwaway statement. It is not a throwaway statement because it ties it back to what Paul has said. You think about the most, where is the most full expressive treatment of Paul's description about what love is in the Scripture. It's not in Ephesians. It's not in Colossians. It's not in Philippians. It's where? It's in 1 Corinthians. And in being in 1 Corinthians, he's, and, and where is the mindset of God the Holy Spirit in terms of the fruit of the Spirit most fully expressed? It's not in Ephesians, it's not in Philippians, it's not in Colossians, it's in Galatians. Why? Because you need all of that material. You need all of that information to come over here into Ephesians and actually operate the way God wants you to operate. So it is amazing when you think about how your Bible is structured and put together and how all the material builds upon the other so that when you come over here to Ephesians, you can actually have the ability to do what that says because the other books have taught you about the mindset and how the mindset of the Holy Spirit works so that now you can come over here and actually put into practice the mind of Christ. It's amazing. So, We are, with, in verse 2, with all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another how? In love. Can I say that if you are married, if you have kids, 
you will have ample opportunity in less than five minutes to practice what we just heard preached. Okay? There's no, there, there you go. There's your homework. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time and for your word and for these truths. We pray that this one anothering idea, this, this, this bodybuilding concept would be something that we would take to heart first individually, first as individual saints, then into our families, and then from our families here into the assembly. We think about how there's a building block structure for how the local church is supposed to function. The local church is supposed to be a collection of families who are functioning with the mind of Christ. And that mind of Christ is not first manifest in the local assembly, it's manifest in the home. It's manifest amongst the family. It's manifest there first, and then it's brought here. And we pray that we will take seriously this issue of bodybuilding and building the body of Christ, both individually, as individual saint, and also corporately as a collective body here at Grace Life Bible Church. We're grateful for this time we can spend together in your word. In Christ's name, amen.